Good afternoon and most welcome to 1382 of the Heidegger series. We will today continue with the article started in 1381. <clears throat> How can we signify being semiotics and topological self signification I left off at 255 the first sentence starting with however however while merely writing about being as I so far have, will not bring it to actuality. This does not mean that the alphabetic text should simply be abandoned in favor of images. For in such a regression to the pre-alphabetic, pre-literate mindset, the sign would lose its differentiated character and with it the conceptual lucidity that alphabetic writing makes possible. Still, the fact remains that alphabetic signification alone will not suffice for the full-fledged expression of being. I suggest then that our text must include iconic signifiers. For the icon bears the internal relationship to what it signifies, that the articulation of being requires but what is the specific nature of the icons that are needed It depends, of course, on the nature of being. Melo-Ponti associated being 
what he called the flesh of the world. An idea for which there is no name in traditional philosophy. The flesh cannot be named in traditional philosophy because it transgresses the most basic categories of the classical tradition. Quote, Flesh is not matter in the sense of corpuluscus of being. It is not mind, it is not substance. To designate it, we should need the old term element. in the sense it was used to speak of water, air, earth and fire. That is in the sense of a general thing. midway between the spatio-temporal individual and the idea, a sort of incarnate principle that brings a style of being wherever there is a fragment of being. The flesh in this sense, an element of being. With the notion of the flesh, Melopontu posed his greatest challenge to the long-standing philosophical division of subject and object. Neither a corporal object nor a disembodied subject The flesh is a coiling over the body, a folding back of it upon itself, from which the subject and its object first arise. To Merleau-Ponty, the flesh of the world 
is a paradox of being. What we are presently looking for is a way of signifying this subject-object paradox that does not reduce being to a mere object as conventional alphabetic signification does. Merleau-Ponty offered two clues in this regard. The Necker Cube. In phenomenology of perception, Merleau-Ponty made use of a well-known visual paradox of modern psychology, the Necker Cube. It is in this structure, I suggest, that can provide us with a preliminary iconic expression of the paradox of being. Let us first consider the classical principle of opposition as demonstrated through visual perspective in figure 1a. The ordinary mode of perception is the classical one. Here we perceive objects and events as extended in the world outside us, but have no immediate access to the inner subjective ground of our perceptions. We cannot see our own act of seeing, touch our own touching. What figure 1a illustrates is that this underlying opposition between the subjective seat of perception in here and the objective realm of out there is reflected in the external objects themselves.
in the diametrical opposition we ordinarily encounter between their concealed and exposed surfaces. Opposing sides of objects cannot be viewed at once. <coughs> Turning now to figure 1b, inspection readily discloses that both of the perspectives shown in figure 1a are encompassed in the body of the neck cube. This creates visual ambiguity. You may be perceiving the cube from the point of view in which it seems to be hovering above your line of vision. When suddenly a spontaneous shift occurs and you see it as if it lay below. Two disparate perspectives surely are experienced in the course of gazing at the cube and this disparity reflects the continuing distinction between opposing sides. But the cubes reversing perspectives overlap one another in space, are internally related. Completely interdependent. Think of what would happen to one perspective if the other were erased. Relevant to the Necky cube relationship of interdependently reversing perspectives is a comment by Melo Ponty in his final work, The Visible and the Invisible. If the hidden face of the cube radiates forth somewhere as well as does the face, I have under my eyes and coexists with it. And if I who see the cube
I, the invisible subject, also belong to the visible. I am visible from elsewhere. And if I and the cube are together caught up in one same element, should we say of the seer or of the visible, this cohesion, this visibility by principle prevails over every momentary discordance. I think we have a comment here for Callen, Dr. Kalle Lundahl. More welcome to use the microphone. I put it on my stomach. And it's, it's enormously complicated. There you go. Yes, uh, to lighten it up. Um, this is much. It relates to the origin of the Greek alphabet in one way or another, and especially the first part of this paper. And I would like to refer to a quotation by Heraclitus, the Ionian philosopher. And in fragment 41, I will read the English translation. The Lord for Anax, whose oracle, the one uh, which is in Delphi, neither speaks nor hides but gives a sign. Um, and this is the origin of the our word sign. It's the same root. It's uh, semine, semine, semine. Semine, or in modern Greek, it would be C my knee or something like that as we can find in semantics for instance. yes yes absolutely absolutely and see uh, also uh, in sign is the same the greek equivalent and and i would uh, like to focus on this greek word <coughs> uh, and i think i have found a way how to uh, overcome this dichotomy between sign and signified uh, one common way of translating this is, is to uh, give a sign. So the Lord, that is Apollo, he gives a sign. And a better translation would be gives signs. Uh, because if, if you translate it, give, give a sign, uh, it's easy to think in social terms. You get stuck in social thinking. Uh, but give signs so it uh, it goes further but i have an even better translation but gives uh, but signs but signs i'm a slightly inspired by derrida uh, who has written much about signing things so i'm making a pun here so sign in uh, like in the english word sign it's also the sign, but signs also to uh, when you have a contract or something you sign. Uh, but he signs. So the Apollo. He signs so that is he. Let's say um, we have a here a pen. He writes something. Uh, although although it's an oral. Um, Delivery, perhaps, uh, because it's an oracle. But since this uh, this very sentence is in is in writing, let's suppose that he uh, he had a pen, or Heraclitus had a pen, so he wrote down uh, the sentence, and he would so to say give the meaning here to you, um, and it it is you who will then sign. Uh, the meaning of this sentence, like this 
what does it mean? Uh, semi has many meanings. So is it the pen, so to say, that is the uh, uh, sign that you give, that is also the signification? Um, so there are many, me, uh, so to say, many layers. Um, or if we want to think in oral uh, oral sense, we have uh, Apollo who gives this sign to you, uh, or rather he signs. So it's he signing something, but the uh, the uh, very act of signing is also the meaning. Uh, so I would I would say that there is no difference between meaning and signing writing uh, so that there is no final meaning in this um, uh, in this context and it's also uh, interesting to know that semaineke also means to give orders so he gives also orders so there is no fixed meaning here uh, so, so let's say you have the Sosurian sign here. Let's say this is a sign, Sosurian sign. Uh, so it would supposedly point to something. But where does it stop? Uh, so it's, I think the meaning is rather here. You, um, he signs, in this case, Apollo signs. Or the, the, the person who receives the message is also the one who signs. So this very pun that I would like to say, but he signs, overcomes uh, the dichotomy between the subject and object. Um, So the question is, who will do the signing? Is it Apollo, or you who receive, uh, you who will receive the message? Really, nobody or the receiver. Uh, somebody has to do. So then it's going. Uh, I think this is a climb bottle uh, uh, problem. Uh, and Heidegger, uh, he often used the verb. Verb is better, or even a participle. Uh, I think the verb is very good because. When you use a verb, you overcome that simplicity thinking is also the terms that you have this uh, referring to something. Uh, when you use a verb, how can you uh, think that it refers to something else? Let's say you uh, we uh, let's say that we have this word uh, science. It's also we are so sure. What would it refer to? Would it refer to my signature? In case it uh, Kalle. That is the receiver, I would be the receiver, or is it Apollo's signature? So to say, I Apollo said it means like this. Uh, so I think the verse signs, but it's also at the same time an order, because it means also he gives orders. Um, I think so when you, I think when you have a problem, like a philosophical problem, or uh, think in terms of verbs, then you overcome often. And so soon he thought often in terms of nouns, like you had a tree and it pointed to a, on the other noun, a concept of trees. And that gets stuck in object thinking. So you go to verbs, they are more active. So that is my take, uh, short, very inspired take <laughs> on the issue. Well, thank you very much, Kalle. You managed to make a Neki cube of the antique text. Very good. I do get the point. Indeed, what does a verb refer to? Very seldom we will be able to fall into the trap of objectifying there and say, I was running and the running was referring. Well, you can't really point to something. Where did the running go? Or where the designing go. You can't hardly say, oh I put all the signing into a box and I keep it in my laboratory. So yes, verbs are not that easy to objectify and make 
invisible for understanding. Merleau-Ponty's best-known example of Necke cube-like reversibility appears elsewhere in the same volume. Near the beginning of the chapter titled The Intertwining, the chiasm, it illustrates the interchange of subject and object as a veritable touching of the touch. When my right hand touches my left hand while it is palpating the things, where the touching subject passes over to the rank of the touched descends into the things. What we have here is a free reversibility of subject and object wherein one moment my left hand plays the role of subject, fingering an object, say, the keyboard of this computer, while in the next moment my left hand itself becomes object to the subjectivity of my right hand. And this reciprocal relation is not limited to the senses, to touching or seeing. According to Melo Ponty, as there is a reversibility of the seeing and the vis visible, so also there is a reversibility of speech and what it signifies. This means that the speaking and thinking object subject no less than the sensing subject is an embodied participant in the earthly transactions of the phenomenological life world not just a detached cogito. Nevertheless, Merleau-Ponty imposes a significant limitation on the interrelatedness of subject and object. We spoke summarily of a reversibility of the seeing and the visible. It 
it is trying to emphasize that it is a reversibility always imminent and never realized in fact. My left hand is always on the verge of touching my right hand. Touching the things. But I never reach coincidence. The coincidence eclipses at the moment of realization. And one of two things always occurs. Either my right hand really passes over to the rank of the touched becomes an object. But then its hold on the world is interrupted it is no longer a subject or it retains its hold on the world. Remains a subject. But then I do not really touch it. My right hand touching, I palpate with my left hand only its outer covering. My comment here, this is a very elegant way of showing the interrelatedness of subject and object. The right hand can never become untouched, no matter what you do. It reminds me of one of the drawings of Escher, a hand drawing itself. We usually assume that that Asher drawing is unique, illusory, imagined, but nothing could be closer to the truth than that very drawing. This is exactly what the interrelationship between subject and object always is. In other words, while what was subject can be known as object a moment later,
I cannot know subjectivity as such. That wait a little bit. No. That will do it. I cannot know subjectivity as such. The subject is still the one who does the knowing, while the object remains that which is known. Apparently then, the intimate reciprocity of subject and object, the foregoing entwinement does not add up to a literal fusion. At least not in terms of what humans can experience to be sure on Mali Ponti's account subject and object are consanguously tied to one another they participate fully in the same order of being. With little difficulty, subject can become object and vice versa. And this cube-like reversibility attests to the blood bound inwardly uniting them. Yet the hinge between them, solid and unshakable, remains irredeemably hidden from me. So according to Melo Ponty, the boundary dividing subject and object holds firm in my experience of them. In passing from one to the other, necessarily there is a break in my awareness, and this gap attests to the mutual exclusion from each other. Melo Ponty does go on to say that this hiatus between my right hand touched and my right hand touching is not an ontological void, a non-being. It is spanned by the total being of my body.
and by that of the world. Still, while there may be, while there may not be an ontological void, the presumably irredeemably epistemological void he posits would be quite enough to forever prevent the realization of full-fledged subject-object intertwinement. He is directly pointing my comment here to the most interesting while passing through one take on the neck cube to the other there's a, a gap it's not smooth and it takes time we have in the middle between two neck cubes a void and a payron if you like this could be called the energy that thrusts the different models or reality itself to spring into life to become lively to come into becoming it's a becomingness normally we miss out on this epistemological void it happens too quickly it is similar to the space between one thought and another or why not my right hand touching the left hand somehow the difference between subject and object cannot be upheld but at the very same time it is the likeness that makes for differentiation this it was causes the objects to become real very aptly put by Melo Ponty I say Thank you very much for listening and have a very pleasant afternoon. Bye bye.